BBC Wales on One, where now Sir Anthony Hopkins makes his directorial debut. Hello, my name is Anthony Hopkins and I want to introduce you to Bob Kingdom's Dylan Thomas's Return Journey. Um, Dylan Thomas was born in 1914. He died in 1953, aged 39. At the time of his death, he had become Wales' most famous poet. He was the son of a schoolmaster. He worked for a time on the South Wales Evening Post and established himself with the publication of 18 poems by 1934. He married Kathleen McNamara in 1936. And he published 25 poems the same year. His other works include uh, The Map of Love, a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Dog, from 1944 onwards, he worked on a radio script about a Welsh seaside village, and in its first form, it was called Quite Early One Morning. Uh, Thomas then later expanded this into Under Milk Wood, which was published in the year after his death. In 1952, uh, his collected poems, 1934 to 1952, was published. In 1955, his unfinished novel, The Adventures in the Skin Trade, uh, was published. And towards the end of his life, Thomas supplemented his income by giving uh, various readings of his works at universities and colleges and institutions across the United States of America. So Dylan Thomas's return journey is our interpretation of those lectures given by Bob Kingdom. I welcome you, culture vultures, to this pot-boiling, lyrical extravaganza, word binge or bender. Standing here as I do, in my Sunday best and one of the Dean of Buffalo University shirts, the self-styled Rambo of Cumdonkin Drive Swansea or poor man's Charles Lawson. Above average height and fearless. Above average height for Wales, I mean. Five foot six and a half, with the face of an excommunicated cherub, a nose that's polished every day, a body when clothed, once so cruelly described as looking like an unmade bed, a staggering swagger that's spoiling for a fight with any pavement bold enough to take me on, and a fancy a pulpit posh voice with brass snubbed on, speaking three languages, English, BBC Third Programme, and Saloon. In my poems that I recite to anyone such as yourselves, a bunch of eccentrics voluntarily cornered, I've had my say. Now all I'm doing is saying it again, giving the works the works. In this first poem, which is a birthday poem, I went to bed at 29, I awoke at 30, and took the new key countryside by surprise with an early morning walk when it wasn't looking. It was my 30th year to heaven. Woke to my hearing from harbor and neighbor wood and the muscle pooled and the heaven priested shore. The morning beckon with water praying and call of seagull and rook and the knock of sailing boats on the net webbed wall. Myself to set foot that second in the still sleeping town and set forth. My birthday began with the water birds and the birds of the winged trees flying my name above the farms and the white horses and I rose in rainy autumn and walked abroad in a shower of all my days. High tide and the heron died when I took the road over the border. And the gates of the town closed as the town awoke. 
a spring full of larks in a rolling cloud, and the roadside bushes brimming with whistling blackbirds, and the sun of October summery on the hill shoulder. Here were fond climates and sweet singers. Suddenly come in the morning, where I wandered and listened to the rain ringing wind blow cold in the wood far away under me. Pale rain over the dwindling harbor and over the sea wet church, the size of a snail with its horns through mist and the castle brown as owl. But all the gardens of spring and summer were blooming in the tall tales beyond the border and under the lark full cloud. Where could I marvel my birthday away? But the weather turned around. It turned away from the blithe country and down the other air and the blue altered sky streamed again. A wonder of summer with apples, pears and red currants. And I saw in the turning so clearly a child's forgotten mornings when he walked with his mother through the parables of sunlight and the legends of the green chapels and the twice told fields of infancy. That his tears burned my cheeks and his heart moved in mine. These were the woods, the river and sea where a boy in the listening summer time of the dead whispered the truth of his joy to the trees and the stones and the fish in the tide. And the mystery sang alive, still in the water and singing birds. And there could I marvel my birthday away, but the weather turned around and the true joy of the long dead child sang burning in the sun. It was my thirtieth year to heaven, stood there then in the summer noon, though the town below lay leaved with October blood. Oh, may my heart's truth still be sung on this high hill in a year's turning. Actually, I have a confession to make about the first line of that poem, my 30th year to heaven. When I started writing it, the line read, it was my 27th year to heaven. But you can't rush into these things blindly and headlong. Heaven's got all the time in the world and heaven just has to wait, that's all. And besides, what chance have I got when the sweet little daughter of a friend with whom I was once staying skipped in from the garden and she said, are you the man with poems in his head? I said, I suppose I am, yes. I have a poem in my head, she said. I eat the wind and I drink the rain. Oh, mersey dotes and dozy dotes and little lambsy tivy. But I still like very much People telling me about their childhood. Because childhood memories have no order and no end. But by God, they'll have to be quick, or I'll be telling them about mine. Rather like now and with this story. From the days when I was so high and much, much nicer. Much, much nicer. Much, much. It is all about today's outing by bus or charabang to a place called Porth Call by the seaside. And it happened when I was staying with my uncle and his wife. Although she was my aunt, I never thought of her as anything but the wife of my uncle. Partly because he was so big and trumpeting and red hairy and he was to fill every inch of the hot little house like an old buffalo squeezed into an airing cupboard. And partly because she was so small and silk and quick 
and made no noise at all as she whisked about on padded paws, dusting the china dogs, feeding the buffalo, setting the mouse traps that never caught her. And once she'd sleeked out of the room to squeak in a nook or nibble in a hayloft, you forgot she'd ever been there. But there he was, always a steaming hulk of an uncle, his braces straining like hawsers crammed behind the counter of the tiny shop at the front of the house and breathing like a brass band. As he ate, the house grew smaller. My uncle's wife was so small, she could hit him only if she stood on a chair. And every Saturday night at half past ten, he would lift her up under his arm onto a chair in the kitchen so that she could hit him on the head with whatever was handy, which was always a china dog. The first I heard of the annual outing was when I was sitting one evening on a bag of rice behind the counter under one of my uncle's stomachs reading an advertisement for sheep dip. The shop was full of my uncle. And when Mr. Benjamin Franklin, Mr. Weasley, Noah Bowen and Will Sentry came in, I thought it would burst. It was like all being together in a drawer. It smelt of cheese and turps and twist tobacco and snuff and whist good. No? Mr. Franklin said that he had collected enough money for the Shadabang and 20 cases of pale ale and a pound a piece over that he would distribute among the members of the outing when they first stopped for refreshments. And he was about sick and tired, he said, of being followed by Will Sentry. All day long, wherever I go, he's after me like a collie with one eye. I got a shadow of my own and a dog. I don't need no Tom, Dick or Harry pursuing me with his dirty muffler on. Will Sentry blushed? It's only oily. I got a bicycle. A man of no privacy at all. I tell you, he sticks so close, I'm afraid to go out the back in case I sit in his lap. Don't you mind, Will Sentry? No harm in old Will. He's only keeping an eye on the money, Benji. Aren't I honest? There was no answer for some time. And then Noah Bowen said, You know what the committee is. Ever since Bob the Fiddle, they don't feel safe with the new treasurer. Do you think I'm going to drink the outing funds like Bob the Fiddle? You might. I resign. Not with our money, you don't. Who puts dynamite in the salmon pool? Cried Mr. Weasley. But nobody took any notice of him. And then on Sunday evening after chapel, Mr. Franklin and Will Sentry walked into the kitchen where my uncle and I were eating sardines with spoons from the tin because it was Sunday and his wife wouldn't let us play draft. I brought the list, every member fully paid. You ask Will Sentry. My uncle put on his spectacles, wiped his whiskery mouth with a handkerchief as big as a Union Jack, took Mr. Franklin's list of names, removed his spectacles so that he could read, and ticked the names off, one by one. Enoch Davis uh, is good with his fists, 
you never know. Little Garawine, very melodious bass. Mr. Cadwallader, that's right. He can tell opening time better than my watch. Mr. Weasley, oh yes, of course. He's been to Paris. Pity suffers so much in the Sharaban. Stopped us nine times last year between the Beehive and the Red Dragon alone. Noah Bowen, ah, very peaceable. He's got a tongue like a turtle dove. Never an argument with Noah Bowen. Jenkins Lacher, yes, but keep him off the economics. It cost us a plate glass window last time and 10 pints for the sergeant. Mr. Jarvis, very tidy, yes. He tried to put a pig in the shara. Live and let live. Old, old Jones? Why old, old Jones? Old, old Jones always goes. Oh. Cuthbert Johnny Fortnight. Now there's a cat. He whistles after women. So do you, in your mind. And soon after that, he went. Full century, no more than an inch behind. Their Sunday bright boots squeaking on the kitchen cobbles. And then suddenly, there was my uncle's wife standing in front of the dresser with a china dog in one hand. If you go on that outing on Saturday, Mr. Thomas, I'm going home to my mother's. It's me or the outing, Mr. Thomas? Well, I would have made my choice at once, but it was almost half a minute before my uncle said. Well then, Sarah, my love, it's the outing. He lifted her up under his arm onto a chair in the kitchen. She hit him on the head with a china dog. And then at breakfast time on Saturday morning, the morning of the outing, I found a note on the kitchen table that said, there's some eggs in the pantry. Take your boots off before you go to bed. My uncle's wife had gone as quick as a flash. When my uncle saw the note, he tugged out the flag of his handkerchief and blew such a hubbub of trumpets that the plates on the dresser shook. It's the same every year, but this year it's different. You'll have to come on the outing too, and what the members will say, I dare not think. Sharaban pulled up outside, and when the members of the outing saw my uncle and me squeeze out of the shop together, both of us cat-lit in our Sunday best, they snarled like a zoo. Are you bringing a boy? Boys is nasty. He hasn't paid his contributions. No room for boys. Boys get sick in Sharaban. So do you. Enoch Davis. Might as well bring women. Women are worse than boys. 26 minutes to opening time. Shouted an old man in a Panama hat, not looking at a watch. They forgot me at once. Good morning, Mr. Cutler. And the Sharabang started off down the street. A few cold women stood at their doorways 
grimly watching us go. A very small boy waved goodbye, and his mother boxed his ears. It was a beautiful August morning. And over the bridge and up the hill and along the dusty road we wove slow cows and ducks flying by until... Stop the bus! I left my teeth on the mantelpiece. Never you mind. You're not gonna bite nobody. No, but I might want to smile. Not you. What's the time, Mr. Cadwallader? Twelve minutes to go. Shouted back the old man in the Panama, not looking at a watch. And they all began to curse him. The Sherebang pulled up outside the mountain sheep. A small, unhappy public house with a thatched roof like a wig with ringworm. The members rushed out bleating and into the bar. You keep an eye on the Sharabang. See nobody steals it. Forty-five minutes passed like a very slow cloud. With only cows for company. <laughs> In the dark bar, they were so happy they were breaking glasses. A shuni onion Breton man, with a berry and a necklace of onions, bicycled down the road and stopped at the door. Kelun Grand Matan, Monsieur, I said. There's French, Boiba. I followed him down the passage and peered into the bar. I could hardly recognize the members of the outing. They'd all changed color. Beetroot, rhubarb, and puce. They hollered and rollicked in that dark, damp hole, like enormous, ancient bad boys. And my uncle surged in the middle, all red whiskers and bellies. Out of the fug and babel, I heard... Come out and fight! No, not now. A bit later. No, now, while I'm in a temper. Then out <laughs> blew my uncle, ballooning. And one by one, the members numbered out after him in a grizzle. They had drunk the mountain sheep dry. Mr. Weasley had won a string of onions of the shuny onion man and rattled at the bar. What's the good of onions when you left your teeth on the mantelpiece? The blue bull, the red dragon, the star of Wales, the tooth in the wool, the sour grapes, the shepherd's arms, the bells of Abba Dhabi. I had nothing to do in the whole wild August world but remember the names where the outing stopped and keep an eye on the Sharabang. Off we drove again at last, the Sharabang bouncing with tenors and dragons, and came to a river that rushed along among willows. Water! 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 They shouted, and dusk came down, warm and gentle, on thirty wild, wet, pickled, splashing men, without a care in the world, at the end of the world, in the west of Wales. Who goes there? Called out little sentry to a wild duck flying. They stopped at the hermit's nest for a rum to keep out the cold. I played rugby for Aberavon in 1898. Liar! I can show you photos. Forged! And I'll show you my cup at home. Stolen! I've got friends to prove it! Bribe! On the way home, through the simmering, moon-splashed dark, old Earl Jones began to cook his supper on a primer stove in the nick of the Sharabang. Mr. Weasley coughed himself blue in the smoke. Stop the bus! I'm dying of breath! We all climbed down into the moonlight. There wasn't a single public house in sight. So they carried out the remaining cases of pale ale and the primer stove and old Earl Jones, and took them into a field, and sat in a circle, and drank and sang, while old Earl Jones cooked sausage and mash, and the moon flew above us. And there I drifted to sleep against my uncle's mountainous waistcoat, and 
as I slip. Who goes there? Called out for a sentry to the flying moon. I wrote a letter to a friend the other day. Dear Dan, isn't life awful? Last week I hit Caitlin with a plate of beetroot and I'm still bleeding. I can't finish a poem or begin a story. I chew my fingernails down to my shoulders, pick three-legged horses with beautiful names, take my legs for gray walks, molder in Brown's Hotel, go to bed as though to an office, read with envy of lonely old women who swig disinfectant by the pint, think about money, Dismiss it as dirt. Think about dirt. To the poet and bank manager, Vernon Watkin, from a safe but penniless lawn. Thank you for the great pound. I could hear it singing in the envelope. Oh, God. What future can there be for the son of a sloth and a turnip? Either I hang by my whiskey toes, thinking of nothing and lust, or sit big-headed in the wet earth, thinking of turnip poems, and time snails by, and San Francisco is 6,000 lamenting miles away, and Wales is dead from the ice to foot up, and day after day I grow lazier and fatter and sadder and older and deafer and duller. Gout snarls in my big toe. My children grow large and rude. I renounce my art to make money and then make no money. I fall in love with undesirable, unloving, squat, moist, taloned, unlovely women and then out again like an old trout. I fall downstairs, daydream of Chile, a place I have absolutely no intention of visiting. And I frighten myself in the night, my own plump banshee, and celebrate other people's birthdays with false, bonominous abandon. Anyway, the wheels of my kind of unkind luck with money were set in motion, or was it punctured? years ago with this next poem, which was the first poem I ever had published in a respectable London journal. I say respectable, but I later discovered that the editor, one rejoicing in the name of A.R. Orridge, was not in the habit of overtaxing his accountant by actually paying poets for contributions. What's a bloody poem worth, anyway? And death shall have no dominion. dominion, dominion, dominion. Dead men naked, they shall be one with the man in the wind and the west moon. When their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone, they shall have stars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. And death shall have no dominion. Under the windings of the sea, they, lying long, shall not die windily, twisting on wrecks when sinews give way. Strapped to a wheel, yet they shall not break. Faith in their hands shall snap in two and the unicorn evils run them through. Split all ends up, they shan't crack, and death shall have no dominion. And death shall have no dominion. No more may gulls cry at their ears, or waves break loud on the seashore, where blue a flower may flower no more, lift its 
said to the blows of the rain. Though they be mad and dead as nails, heads of the characters hammer through daisies, break in the sun till the sun breaks down, and death shall have no dominion. It was a cold, white day in High Street, and nothing to stop the wind slicing up from the docks. For where the squat and tall shops had shielded the town from the sea, lay their blitzed flat graves, marbled with snow and headstones with fencing. Dogs, delicate as cats on water, as though they had gloves on their paws, padded over the vanished buildings. Boys romped calling high and clear on top of a leveled chemist's and shoe shop. And a little girl wearing a man's cap threw a snowball in a chill, deserted garden that had once been the jug and bottle of the Prince Square. The wind cut up the street with a soft sea noise hanging on its arm, like a hooter in a muffler. I could see the swathed hill stepping up out of the town, which you could never see properly before and the powdered fields of the roofs of Milton Street and Watkins Street and Fuller's Row. As I began my search through Swansea Town, cold and early, on that wicked February morning, I went into the hotel. Good morning. The hall porter did not answer. I was just another snowman to him. He didn't know that I was looking for someone after 14 years and he didn't care either. The bar was just opening, but already one customer puffed and shook at the counter with a full pint of half-frozen river towy water in his wrapped up hand. The barmaid was polishing the counter vigorously as though it were a rare piece of Swansea china. Seen the film at the Elysium, Mr. Griffith? There's snow, isn't it? Did you come up on your bicycle our pipes burst Monday? Pint of bitter, please. Proper little lick in the kitchen. Got to wear your wellies when you boil an egg. One and four, please. The cold gets me just by ear. I don't know what would happen if I didn't wear a band. That's your liver, Mr. Griffith. You've been on the coco again. I wonder if you remember a friend of mine. He used to come in here some years ago. Every morning about this time. What's his name, love? Young Thomas. Thomas? Oh, lots of Thomases come in here. It's a kind of home from home for Thomases, isn't it, Mr. Griffith? What's he look like? He'd be about 17 or 18. I was 17 one. Thick blubber lips, curly mouse brown hair, one tooth broken after playing a game called Cats and Dogs in the Mermaid Mumbles. Speaks rather fancy, truculent, plausible, a bit of a show-off. Plus fours and no breakfast, you know. Used to have poems printed in the Herald of Wales. There was one about an open-air performance of Electra in Mrs. Bertie Perkins's garden in Sketty. Lived up the uplands. A bombastic, adolescent, provincial bohemian with a thick, knotted artist tie made out of his sister's scarf. She never knew where it was gone. And a cricket shirt dyed bottle green. A gabbing, ambitious, mock-tough, pretentious young man. And moly, too. Oh, there's words. What you want to find him for? I wouldn't touch him with a barge pole, would you, Mr. Griffith? No, I wouldn't. Mind you, you can never tell. I remember a man came in here with a monkey. He ordered a half for himself and a pint for the monkey. And he wasn't Italian at all. Spoke Welsh like a preacher. I seem to remember a chap like you described. There couldn't be two like him, let's up. He used to work as a reporter. Down the three lamps, I used to see him lift is a elbow. What's the three lamps like now? It isn't like anything. It isn't there. It's nothing, man. You remember Ben Evans' stores? Well, it's right next door to that. Ben Evans isn't there either. I went out of the hotel into the snow and walked down High Street, past the flat white waste where all the shops had been. Edershaw furnishes, 
Dr. Shaw, Burton the tailor, Boots Cash chemists, Leslie stores, Ups and Shoes, Prince of Wales, Tucker's Fish, Dead and Simpson. All the shops bombed and vanished. Past the hole in space where Hodges and Clothies had been. Down Castle Street, past the remembered invisible shop. Prices 50 shilling, tribes the jewelers. Potter Gilmore gowns, Master's Outfitters, the Cardoma, Lloyd's Bank. And nothing. And into Temple Street. There the three lamps had stood. Old Mac, magisterial in his corner. And there the young Thomas, whom I was searching for, used to stand at the counter on Friday pay nights. A man among men. His hat at a rakish angle. In that snug, smug select, Edwardian holy of best bitter holies. What have you been reporting today, young Thomas? Two typewriter Thomas, the ace news dick. Let's have a look at your notebook. Called at British Legion, nothing. Called at hospital, one broken leg. Auction at the Metropole. Bazaar at Bethesda Chapel. Chimney on fire in Tontine Street. Walters Road, Sunday School outing. Rehearsal of the Mikado at Skewen. All front page stuff, see. All front page stuff, see. All front the voices of 14 years ago hung silent in the snow and ruin. And in the falling winter morning, I walked on through the white habit center, where once a very young man I knew had mucked about as chirpy as a sparrow after the sips and titbits and small change of the dust. Near the evening post building and the fragment of the castle, I stopped a man whose face I thought I recognized from a long time ago. I said, I wonder if you can tell me. Yes. He peered out of his blanketing scarves and from under his snowballed balaclava like an Eskimo with a bad conscience. I said, I wonder if you can tell me if you knew a chap called young Thomas. He worked on the post and used to wear an overcoat sometimes with a giant check lining inside out so that you could play giant drafts on it. He wore a conscious woodbine, too. What do you mean, conscious woodbine? And a pork pie hat with a peacock feather. And he tried to slouch like a news hawk, even when he was only attending a meeting of the Gusein and Buffaloes. Oh, him. He owes me half a crown. I haven't seen him since the old car door.